everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the origins of life. Topic for the day is support for evolution. Um, before we get going, let me apologize if you tried to view this video earlier. I just realized that there was only like a half video up on YouTube. So sorry for that. This should be the full thing, hopefully. So by the end of this video, here's the things that I need you to know or be able to do. There's just one objective for today and that is to understand and be able to describe each of the major categories of support for the theory of evolution. There's four major categories. I'm going to go through each one, talk about a little, talk about each one a little bit, and then that'll be it for the day. So let's jump right in. All right, first thing. Now, as I talk about support for evolution today, let me just note that everything I'm going to talk about is stuff that is not speculative. These are things that we can see and touch and feel, and this is what we know. And we know that well, we know it by observation, and then we know that it also fits into the framework of the idea of evolution. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. The first major category of support is direct observation. These are things or examples of evolution that we see in everyday life now. Um, first one is MRSA, which is a antibiotic resistant strain of uh, bacteria that is often found in hospital settings. It's a terrible, terrible strain of bacteria, causes a lot of injury and death and sickness. But we see evolution in that in that it is resistant to multiple kinds of antibiotic. Over the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 years since it's really come on the scene, hospitals have had a hard time controlling it because every time they expose it to another antibiotic, it becomes resistant to it and thus you have a new strain. So you see the population of MRSA evolving over time as antibiotics are introduced to it, it becomes resistant to those antibiotics. Another one is the soapberry bug, which you see there on the right. Um, when I lived down in Florida, we had these vines called balloon vines. And balloon vines, we've got a big kind of round balloon-shaped fruit on it. Inside that fruit are uh, seeds. And this bug on the right, the soapberry bug, feeds on those seeds. You can see his little beak hanging down there. He would stick that beak through the fruit to get into the seed, to uh, suck from the seed. And that's how they fed. Now the thing is, the balloon vine is becoming less common in Florida, but there's a second tree called the Asian raindrop tree. Very pretty tree. Um, it's introduced from Asia, and it's got a similar fruit on it, but the fruit of the rain tree, or the golden rain tree, the seeds are closer to the surface than they are on the balloon vine. So scientists from the University of Utah hypothesize that as this bug's main food source, the balloon vine, becomes less common, and this golden rain tree, which they're feeding on, becomes more common, the population of those soapberry bugs should shift such that their beaks will become shorter over time because, the, like I said, the seed on the golden rain tree is closer to the surface than it is on the balloon vine. They did a lot of research, collected a lot of samples, and they did find that, indeed, over time, the uh, population of soapberry bugs has shifted such that their beaks have gotten shorter for feeding on that golden raindrop tree instead of feeding on the balloon vine. So first category, direct observation. Those are just two quick examples of, of things that we see going on right now. Second category is homology, and this is one that you'll hear scientists talk about a lot. It's essentially the idea that there are anatomical and molecular structures that are common throughout many animals, and they show progress from one form to the next. This is a diagram that you'll see quite frequently, and it essentially shows bone structure for the forelimbs of many mammals. And if you start over here, you can see human they have colored all the bones and kind of followed them through. So this would be our upper arm bone, the humerus. They show that you see something similar in the horse, the cat, the bat, the bird, and a whale. You go down here, and in humans, we got the radius and the ulna. And you can see, similar to one of those bones, and then the second bone you can see colored in there. And then you got our wrist bones, which you see going across all of them. And then the phalanges. So the idea is that if there was a common ancestor, it would make sense that all animals that descended from that ancestor would just show a modification on this idea of the bone structure. Take the existing structure in the last common ancestor and then start modifying that structure for particular uses in particular animals. Molecular homology is a lot easier to compare. You just run DNA through a sequencer and you can see how closely related the DNA is. Um, 
humans, all of our DNA is 99% alike between all of us. If you go back to us and chimps or bonobos, 98% match. As you go further back, there is less and less match. But the idea is that, you know, as animals diverge from one another over time, the same common, um, I guess, bases, sequence and genes would still be there and then there would just be slight variation that gave the differences that made humans humans and chimps chimps so that would be anatomical and molecular homology know that homo means same so this is the study of sameness and then I've got a weird outlier there vestigial structures and this is kind of something that scientists have found in I don't know a couple examples are snakes and whales and humans um, they're structures that are in the bodies of these organisms that don't really have a purpose and don't really do anything. And scientists say that within the narrative of evolution, it would make sense that there would still be some leftover bits that haven't fully evolved out of those organisms, but also is not used for a whole lot of anything. Um, two quick examples, human appendix, it helps us with a few things, but we can certainly do without it. It's a vestigial structure. And then as far as whales are concerned, if you look at the skeleton of a whale back towards their tail end, they have got the bones of what looks like the remnant of a pelvis and a rear hind limb. So obviously that pelvic bone isn't any good to an animal that doesn't have any rear legs. So scientists say, like, why are there these random bones hanging out in the back of a whale that don't seem to be there for anything or aren't doing anything? So that is an example of vestigial structure, and it's just like leftover bits from the path of evolution. All right, our next idea to talk about is the tree of life, and this stems directly out of the idea of homology, both molecular and structural. Um, as long as scientists have been observing organisms, they have been realizing that there are these similarities between organisms. And Darwin was one of the first to construct what he called a tree of life, which was essentially starting with a common ancestor and then moving out two branches that showed how organisms diverged from one another. Now, when Darwin did this, he did it based on common structures, and what he saw was similar between animals. So the way that this would be constructed is a connection point is a last common ancestor, and then you see a divergence in lines. Every time an organism diverges, that represents the development of some unique trait. So you can see that this blue dot would represent unique traits developed in this organism. Same for this one, and this one, and that one. Now going back this way, all of these organisms would have a lot of other traits in common, just not this unique trait right here. Um, like I said, this was uh, in the past done using homology, bone structure, physical characteristics, behaviors, things like that. Scientists are now making these trees based on genetic sequencing of the DNA, which obviously is a much more exact way of constructing a tree like this. So I just wanted to show you that and make you aware that this is connected to the idea of homology. Next idea that I want to talk about is, I'm calling same but different. Sorry, we're kind of stuck in the homology section for a second. Um, convergent evolution and analogous structures. So I talked about homologous structures. Those are structures that have got the same basic structure or at least modifications on a theme, but they may not have the same function. So like our arms is going to be homologous with the fin of a whale, but obviously those limbs have got very different uh, purposes. So same structure, different function. Analogous structures are the opposite. They've got the same function, but they are different structures. So a quick example of this is the uh, wings of an insect and the wings of a bird. Vastly different structures, but they've got the same purpose of flying. And the idea behind this is that if evolution were working on organisms, they would show similar adaptations or uh, I guess similar solutions to the same problem. So problem being flight, insects show one solution, birds show another solution. They have converged on the same idea, so that's convergent evolution. Um, Another example of this, up on the top there, you see like one line is placental mammals, the other side is marsupials. At the top, you've got the flying squirrel on the left, uh, native to North America, the sugar glider on the right, and both of those organisms, though one has a placenta and one is a marsupial, they both have evolved the flap of skin between their forelimbs and their hind limbs, which helps them to glide from tree to tree. So it's just the idea that, you know, evolution pushes organisms towards similar, uh, similar solutions, though the organisms may not be directly related to one another. 
All right, finally moving on to something else. Fossil record. Now, for some reason, there is always debate around the fossil record. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it complete? Is it incomplete? Here's what we know. There are a lot of fossils that have been found. In general, those fossils show a very consistent trend from oldest fossils being least complex, newest fossils being most complex. For hundreds and hundreds of organisms, there is a very solid trend of evolution from one stage of the organism to the next. So you can see changes in the structure of the organism over time as you move from one common ancestor up through a tree of life, if you will. Um, there are gaps in the fossil record, obviously, um, because we can only find fossils as you happen upon them. So those gaps hopefully will be filled. I will say that over time, as fossils have been discovered, they fit into the narrative of evolution rather than fighting against it. There have not been many instances where scientists have found a fossil and it has not filled some gap that was in the tree of life. So just know that in general, fossil record is very reliable. It shows consistent trends. There are some weird outliers, like there's this thing called the Cambrian explosion where suddenly a ton of body plans appeared on the scene without any precursors. So there are, like, there are outliers, but in general, when fossils are found, they fit into this narrative of evolution of over time organisms becoming more complex and they fill in gaps that are, I guess, remaining f between one organism and the next. Biogeography is the last support for evolution I want to talk about. Um, back in the day, there was a guy named Alfred Wagner. He was a meteorologist, but he was really interested in plate tectonics and the movement of the continents. And he was kind of one of the first ideas to serious first guys to seriously propose the idea that all the continents had been connected at one point in time in a supercontinent. And then he was the guy that proposed that the continents drifted apart from each other over time. Darwin looked at this work and this idea that the Earth was really old. Um, he was reading some books by Lyle at the time that talked about geology and the Earth being really old. And he thought, well, maybe like I can apply this idea of the Earth being really old to animals and just kind of infer that over time, if you know continents can move apart slowly, slowly, then animals can diverge slowly, slowly. And one of the other things he looked at is this work that showed that animals, fossils, like fossils of the same animal are found on vastly separated continents. So like South America and Africa, you can see there's that orange band showing one type of animal, and then there's that kind of brown one that goes Africa, India, Antarctica, the big green one that goes across all four or five continents and then the blue one that's Africa and South America. So his idea was that animals must have been around and existing for a long time because they would have had to have existed, passed away, been fossilized, all while that supercontinent was still together. And then as that continent drifted apart, it took the fossils along with it. So Darwin was kind of getting his head around the idea that the Earth was old and that there had been a lot of time for the process of natural selection to work upon populations and help animals to diverge from one another. Let me finish up with this. So you always hear the theory of evolution. It's always like debated, oh, evolution is just a theory. It could be disproved at any time. We need to check the way we use that word theory. In normal everyday speak, theory is like an educated guess. If you were to draw like a comparison, it would be compared to a hypothesis in science. It's like saying, well, I think this is going to happen. In science, if you are using the word theory, you are talking about some description or idea that's kind of like an umbrella that holds a bunch of information together. It helps to explain that information, and as new information is found, it fits under this umbrella. That is what the theory of evolution is. It's, it explains ideas, it explains observations, it explains trends that are seen in geology, that are seen in biology, that are seen in some of the physical sciences. It explains some of our findings in molecular, like genetic stuff. It is like a big thing. Now, do know that scientists, by their nature, they are very skeptical. So they are continually looking for evidence that I guess would work against this idea of evolution because that's their, like, that's their job is to disprove things. But time and time again, evidence comes in that if you were to put it on a scale, 
lands on the side of evolution and lends support to this idea. So know that when we say the theory of evolution, we are actually talking about a big overarching explanation for a lot of different pieces of information rather than just an educated guess. So I hope that this tutorial was helpful for you. Sorry for the ugly edit in the middle. Um, my computer freaked out for a second. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.